going to do anything different than we've done in the last two days. We're going to have a heater. Our heater meeting is going to be unlike the sales meeting. You know, when I went to all the 24 stores and gave sales meetings, you know, you give the old Dale Carnegie approach, the enthusiasm, the drive. You never say a thing about what could happen to a heater or why because salespeople should never be deflated. They always should be elated, right? You guys are, are really the nerve center of your company and we're going to tell you all the nuts and bolts and the reasons that these things happen and why they happen. Before I start off, I want you to know I'm not an engineer. I did not build a product. I'm going to only tell you about it. Now, if as I tell you about it, I tell you the bad things, the one thing that Ben and I will swear you to is that this is private information and you should keep that information to yourself and don't go back and tell your store members what a lousy piece of junk the party heater is. It's your business is to repair heaters and if heaters didn't break down you wouldn't be here, right? You'd be selling them or using them or doing something else. Um, ben and I decided when we started the meeting uh, Tuesday morning that it's very important that you understand all the things that's wrong with these heaters so that you can fix them. And it's the hardest thing in the world for me to do is to talk about it, you know, the, the, to start talking about what's wrong with heaters. I usually teach myself and teach my own people to work on heaters, but it's kind of difficult for me to say to you, now you got to look for this, you got to look for that, and you got to look for the other thing, because my income is derived strictly from selling heaters. After they're sold and after sold, I don't make a penny, you know. What you do with heaters in your store doesn't make Gene Volker a red cent. But if you would carry back some detrimental statements to your store people, it would cost me money. Now, I'm making it a point because it's very important as, me as mechanics you understand that fact. Then I can confide in you and tell you all the, all the things that I know about the product. So, with that out of the way, we'll go on with the business. We have three things to cover today. We're going to talk about inline aspirator heaters, and we're going to talk about air scoop heaters, and we're going to talk about propane heaters. Uh, propane usually shows up after lunch because we've got to go down to the store and pick up a couple units. The, uh, the talking about, about the, uh, the, the uh, aspirator units, at, at the store sales meeting, I used a... Uh, paint sprayer to illustrate the very simple uh, functions of an aspirator heater like the one you see before you. I think everyone in the world, kids in, in high school would understand what this gadget is I got in my hand. It's that well known. It's a spray gun. And everyone knows that if you have an air compressor that, that has up to 50 pounds of pressure of air, coming up and over a standpipe, it sucks the paint up into the uh, stream and, and sprays it. And the two things that affect the spray is the size uh, nozzle you have in it and the PSI of the pressure you put on, uh, use with it. Now, th if it's that simple to make a spray gun, it's really that simple to make that heater. Now, I, I, by the same example, you know, if there were women in the crowd, I would say, do you know, remember the old perfume anomizers where you have a little round bulb and on a little glass bowl and you press the bulb and you squirt perfume. It's the same idea. You're atomizing uh, a, a heavy liquid by passing air over a standpipe and sucking the uh, material up into the airstream and squirting it. Now if you look at, a, at a, an inline heater, our inline low pressure heater, it really is exactly the same idea. On the back of the heater we have a little air compressor, which we'll go into in a few minutes and, and really get into it and talk about it. A motor and a fan. Now, when the, when the motor's turning, it, the, the compressor turns and produces about nine and a half pounds of pressure. Those nine and a half pounds of pressure goes into a regulating system that allows air to escape, and as you close off the escape, you force the pressure to go to the nozzle. And as that pressure goes through a copper tube and up to the nozzle, it creates a vent venturi suction or aspirator suction and sucks the kerosene up into the airstream and squirts it into the combustion chamber. Then you have a little 6,000 volt transformer that fires a spark plug 
that fires the mixture and you have a heater. Now, it isn't any more com complicated than that. The people who complicate it, of course, is ourselves. You know, we, we try to make our, our product look a little more uh, difficult to work on, but really it's a very simple heater, very, very simple. The three things that'll affect the heater, the three major things that'll affect this heater is if this little green air filter gets dirty and blocks off the air, it'll burn cool. If the fuel is wrong, which is our biggest single problem, and if the air pressure going to the nozzle isn't right. Those are the three major things that we look for when, whenever we uh, start working on a heater. Now, let me show you something. I carry with me uh, a turkey baster. I, well, you can baste the hammer or anything else, but I call it turkey baster. This turkey baster to me is where the way I convince my customers, the guys who I work on their heaters, what the problem is. If the guy's using anything but kerosene or number one fuel oil and he says he's got fumes, guys, you ain't going to correct it. There's nothing you can do as a mechanic that's going to make the heater burn clean. So the first thing you got to do when you when you the guy brings the heater to you, and you're going to get all of them. You know, I mentioned yesterday if we if we sell. And we do sell two quality farm and fleet, say, 3,000 oil heaters a year. And if 30 of them goes bad, you guys are going to get to 30. You'll never see the 2,970. Never hear of them. So in your minds, in your way of thinking, in all mechanics way of thinking, man, it could be engineered a lot better. But see, we're not engineers. We're not supposed to be engineers. We can only follow the rules of the th that, that's laid out before us. So I take my little... Uh, baster and I get me a, a baster full of fuel and I put it in a cup or a glass and I take it over and I say now Jeff the heater's supposed to run on kerosene or number one fuel oil and what you're using is something other than that you don't have to tell him what he's using but see kerosene or number one fuel oil is pure white it's not colored there's no yellow to it when it starts getting yellow it's other than kerosene or number one fuel oil and as it gets yellower darker yellow it gets worse, and as it gets worse, it's going to stink. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. You can't help the man. If you drain the tank, put, clean the system, make that heater work like brand new, and he takes it home and puts that same crap in it, he's going to bring it back the next day with the same complaint. So what we have to do as mechanics is say to, to the guy, look, you know, this is your problem. That's the first simple thing. Now, if he says, well, I know it, and I don't mind the fumes, I just want the heater to burn, you can make it burn. In other words, you can make the, the fire burn and keep it burning with worse fuels, but it's just going to smell like hell, okay? All right, now, at this point, we've got to warn you about something. The li liability insurance and liability problems on, on all equipment is getting way out of hand these last couple of years and getting so bad that... We first warn mechanics that if you have a heater come back to you, I don't care how old it is, I don't care who sold it to the man, and you don't put it in like new condition with factory replacement parts, you actually take upon yourself the liability of the product. Now, think about what I'm saying. If, if this heater comes back to you and he's got the flame out control unhooked, or he's got it rewired, or he's done something to change it, you've got to put it back like the book calls for. That is your responsibility as a mechanic for quality farm and fleet. Now they'll come back and they'll say, Jeff, don't, don't look, hey, that, that flame out control is nothing but a pain in a what's doodle and, 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 and don't put that thing back on. I don't need that on there. Well, really, you know, he doesn't really need it on there. But the book says it should be there, and if it should be there, you must put it there. And if he says, don't put it on, you say, I can't work on your heater. You cannot adjust, alter, or change a product. No product, unless it's factory approved that you should do this. It's just the way it is, see? Now, give you an example. We, we make a little salamander heater, a little, little, little gas heater, very simple heater, okay? The, uh, sold it to a distributor in Kansas City three years ago who sold it to a block plant who used it for three years and then overhauled it. 
and then burned down the block plant and sued me, Gene Volker, now not Champion Heater Company, but Gene Volker and Champion Heater Company and the guy that made the hose, which was Swan of Rubber, and the guy that made the regulator, which was Fisher, sued me for $3,700 because I sold a product that he, the lawyer considered to be unsafe because I used a pipe fitting where a propane fitting should go, or to his uh, idea. Now, we didn't put that pipe fitting on there. We had a, a flared fitting on it, like it should be. His mechanic or somebody changed it now, but see, we don't get out of it that easy. They don't allow us to say, well, we didn't put that pipe fitting on there. We've got to prove that we didn't put it on. I have to hire a lawyer and prove it. It cost me $1,000 already, personally. And you can't just say, well, hell, that's not my problem. I'm just not going to do anything about it because by, if you just keep your mouth shut and they get judgment on you, they, they can take your house and your car and your dog and your cat and everything you got, buddy. You know. So I'm warning you, as a mechanic, when you work on a tractor, a heater, a lawnmower, whatever you work on, whatever the factory parts list calls for, that's what you do. If a guy brings a riding mower back to you and all of the safety uh, uh, features have been removed, you, by, by the law today, has to put all of that back on, whether the customer likes it or not. Are you with me? Now, I'm saying that because on heaters, heaters are very easy to adjust. And heaters are very easy to make mistakes on. Now, like as an example, I'll give you a, a, just a, a, a quickie. One gallon of kerosene equals 140,000 BTUs of heat. Now, most of the older fellows know that because they've heard it over and over. So every heater that we have has a certain size nozzle in it to allow a certain amount of fuel to enter the combustion chamber that makes that heater 100,000 BTUs of heat. This heater <coughs> will burn 75% of a gallon of fuel per hour. This little heater, 40,000 BTU, will burn two-fifths of a gallon per hour. Now, every heater has its own individual nozzle. They all look alike. It's pretty darn hard to tell the difference. But if you were, if the guy says, you know, uh, that heater don't burn hot enough for me, and he puts a bigger nozzle in it, the 151 nozzle in it, if you, as the example, unknowing, and I, w without, that's reason for these meetings, don't realize that you can put the wrong nozzle in. You put the wrong nozzle in and he takes it back and burns the barn down, you're responsible. You've altered the heater. I know, it's, I know that sounds pretty bad, but it's like the Baptist preacher get up and say, and if you, if you don't do certain things, you're going to go to hell. It sounds bad, but see, it's just absolutely true. You know, that what I'm telling you is facts because I've lived with it now, and I know. I always said that, oh, they, they can't do that to me, but they can. So be careful. You got a book in front of you, that book gives you parts list and operating instructions and tells you what parts should go back in the heater. You don't take a ready heater transformer and put it in a champion heater. You don't take a champion transformer and put it in a ready heater. You know why? Because we didn't approve his transformer. And you take his transformer and put it in our heater and something happens and the law comes back and we take that heater and check it out and that transformer is not our transformer. That's, we, we, the law then holds us not responsible, okay? They say, well, who changed the transformer? Francis did. You're responsible. <coughs> now, if you were a mechanic working out of your garage at home, <coughs> working on a variety of equipment, this probably wouldn't be very important to you. Because the chances of anyone coming back and suing a man in his own garage that's doing repairs on things, it's very, they, they know you don't have anything to get anyway, and it costs an awful lot to sue. But the big Q makes the big difference. The big Q's got lots of money, and they love to go after the big Q, right? But they'll get lawyers and bang it to you, buddy. Now, since I've got through that much, and if I can get over here and not step on myself as I go, the first thing we want to talk about is the 40,000 heater, and I guess this, this out of all the heaters that we have to show you today, has had the most changes over the last three years of any of the products. 
Now, first of all, let me explain that the, the 40,000 V2 heater is made for intermediate use in garages and workshops and places where you wouldn't burn it 24 hours a day. Secondly, we compete with the Ready Heater 30,000 and to do that we took every penny out of the heater we could take out of the heater. And we took so much out of it that we uh, ended up putting a heck of a lot back in because we did some things wrong. And the first thing that I, I need to tell you that we did wrong with the heater was, and I'll just start at one end and go through it, how's that? We put a little plastic filter air adjustment uh, unit on, on the heater that the, the idea in the beginning was that you could carry these on the shelf and when the customer uh, needed to change his filter unit, he simply unsnapped it like I just did and for $1.75 replace it with a preset air adjustment. In other words, it would already be preset to five, uh, four and a half pounds. Several things happen. The worst of all is that it's a very brittle material and with very little effort you can really screw it up. Like as an example, I just pulled it off and I pulled the top barb off just doing like that, that easy. But what's the worst thing that I found on it was that if you bounce the heater enough times You'll get hairline cracks in the back of the, either on the barb or, or the two stands, you'll get a little hairline crack in the, in the plastic. And I'll pass that around, you'll see it if you look real, real careful at it. And when you get that hairline crack, that, that filter will not hold pressure for you and your heater won't work. I know you all found that out already, right? Uh, the second thing was that the factory our, our factory production people didn't agree with what the engineers said and they didn't put it together and preset it. They sent you the plastic and they sent you the little ball bearing and a spring and a nut, right? And you put it together yourself. Then you got to put a gauge on it and set the pressure. We didn't intend it to be that way in the beginning. Now, <coughs> as you go through the heater, the the, the thing that really ate our lunch for us, of course, was the barbs on the nozzle holder. Remember those? I know Francis does. But boy, we, we, we uh, tell you newer fellas, what happened was, it went, see, it's, it's, a, it's a brass nozzle holder. These two little barbs, one's air and one's, one's fuel, uh, was made out of a black plastic material and as the heater fired up the first time, it would fire for maybe 30, 45 minutes until the, the whole back end of the heater start heating, warming up. And then these black uh, barbs would just close up. And, and it would start spitting and sputtering and raising the cane and finally stop. It just wouldn't have any fire at all, just nothing but smoke and crud, you know. And we didn't know, really know what, what it was. The first one I ran into was at the Andersons in Maumee, Ohio, where they was having a demo days, and this was early, like, um, middle of October, and cold, kind of chilly, so I went and got a 40, a brand new 40, which I was so proud of, put fuel in it, so that I would heat up the area that I was standing in out there on the, on the parking lot. And in 30 minutes, it starts spitting and sputtering and doing things like I'd never seen a heater do, and I didn't know what it was. So I started setting pressures, right? first thing you do, and do all kinds of things, but I just couldn't make it, so I went and got another one. Put that one underneath the table, you know. And another one did the same thing. And the third one did the same thing. I knew I had problems. I knew we had problems, right? You guys had bought like 500 of those heaters that year, and we changed all of them. I don't believe there's any left. If there is, if you get a, a 40,000 BTU of the three years ago vintage, and you're working on it and it's got any, anything but brass barbs on it, if it's got the, the, the little black barbs, replace them. Now when I say replace them, I mean make out a warranty slip, put on your time, you know, but it's under warranty, you can get full coverage on it. Uh, because that little thing right there is what caused us all of our problems. No, not all of our problems. That, that causes us the biggest problem. I'll rephrase my statement.
the uh, the next thing that happened on the heater was that now we got the barb straightened out and the heater's burning good but if it was on a thermostat and cycled say 25 30 times suddenly it would start misfiring it just it would just not come on it just stop you know and again we'd go back and start pulling them and looking at them and we found out that now trying to take money out of the unit we we uh, we used an automotive type spark plug and the spark plug was built right up in close to the nozzle and what would happen is this heater cycled it would carbon up the spark plug and that spark plug would just get carbon completely solid and when it got completely solid, of course, it wouldn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't cycle the, the last time. So what the company did uh, was they made a, a new nozzle holder with a spark plug uh, already amount, mounted in the unit, put it in a little box, and called it a number A300-13, if you all want to make a note of it. And this became available to you. Now, what we do with this is there's two... Uh, sheet metal screws that holds this bracket on, the old bracket and the new. You simply take those out, put this on, put the nozzle back in, and by the way, the nozzle, as it was, fits in correctly, just, just like it should, and away you go. And it really solved the problem. Now, before I get your, your toolbox open, I'm going to go on through with this story because you need to hear it. The following year, we made a 55,000 BTU. Now, I, I know most of you old timers understand. Um, I know I got one of those books here. Give me your. <coughs> For like 12 years, we made the uh, the 60,000 BTU. 100,000 BTU, or 97,000, and 150,000 BTU inline heater. Then we, we designed the 40,000, and the 40,000 was to compete with the ready heater's 30,000, okay? Then we built the 55,000 because our 60,000 is, is what we classed as a heavy duty, uh, <coughs> constant use heater. This, this is a heavy duty, very finely made heater. We never have any problem with it, 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 it outside of normal service problems. So the company finally after the 40 fiasco and all the trouble we went through decided what they would do is take the guts of the 60 and put them in the 55 and make the shell of the 55 look differently. And that's so that we could reduce the price $65 and get competitive with ready heater. You with me? So suddenly in this heater, we had a heavy duty motor, you know, compressor, filter unit, everything it should be. So in 1979, what we did was we changed the 40 without telling you about it to the same guts that the 55 had. If you notice, it's a totally different heater. Have you had a chance to look at it? It's a different heater altogether. It's, it still has the rubber tubes, it has, it has a few things that that the old heater had, but the main part of the heater, the motor, air compressor, and uh, unit is, is with, between the 40, the 55, and the 60 are all interchangeable. All, all the same unit, all, the only change in it would be, of course, uh, would be what a heater you put on and what fan you put on it. So it's going to solve our problems as we go into this, this coming season, but you fellers, your big problem is that you're going to be faced with all these old jobbies out in the, you know, that people bring back that they're just firing up and saying, what's wrong with my heater? The first thing on a 40,000 is look at that, that, and it won't have that little, little cheap filter on it anymore either. It won't have any more breaking plastic. I, th I think the Lord with all the little goodies every day, you know. That thing really raised all kinds of uh, problems for me, this little thing won't have that and it won't have any uh, plastic hose barbs and it has, it'll have the right nozzle nozzle holder in it the uh, I 
I don't know what I did with it. I, we lo we're losing parts of these things as we go along. Um, and yeah, it's, it's there's just slowly just disappearing. Give me a screw uh, pair of pliers out of there, will you? Needle nose, you got them. It surprised me in the last two days that most of the guys didn't realize that the 40,000 BTU had a fuel filter in it. This little plastic filter sits right down into the tank, you know, nestles down there, nice, and you can't see it, you can't feel it, but it's in there. And uh, they didn't realize that it had a filter in it. And, and, and one of them said, well, I, that, that's the problem I have with that one I got in the shop. I can't get any fuel. I said, well, this little plastic filter is all clogged up. You know, now, let me tell you something. The guy who designed that filter and that grommet that goes in that tank had to be a little sadistic. Because if you put this in that grommet and try to put that grommet in that tank, it ain't gonna go. It just will it. It ain't gonna go. You gotta put the grommet in the tank and then you gotta put the filter down through and then push the filter in and it'll go. I worked for solid two hours one day trying to get that in there. Couldn't figure out why in the world it wouldn't go in. I thought, well, you're all thumbs. You know, it's a bad day for you. Go home and dry it tomorrow. As a matter of fact, I showed the fellas, and uh, we'll take this out in a minute. The one I have in here now, somebody, and I think it was that son-in-law of mine, took a pocket knife and trimmed it so that it would go in. You know, really, things will go back the way they were if you think about it hard enough and long enough. The way, if you took it out, if you put it back in, if something gets real, 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 real stubborn, there's usually a trick that you're missing that, that it should work. You know, I even oiled it up so it'd slide in easier, you know. <laughs> it, it just wouldn't work. Just wouldn't go. Now, a day like today, where it's very, very cold and very, very damp, are the days we have the biggest single problems with heaters and with vein type heaters, low pressure heaters anyway. The veins in that air compressor that you had before you, you all know, are made out of a carbon material that's self-lubricating. But if it can condensate, if in other words, if water can get through the filter and into that compressor on a day like today, and then tonight if they shut the heater down and tomorrow morning try to start it up, chances are it ain't gonna start. And the reason it won't start is that the water in that little air compressor is going to be froze up. And when it freezes up, it's pretty well frozen. Now you can take it in the house and get it warmed up, or take it in the shop and get it warmed up and it'll work fine. You put it in the pickup truck and take it back to the, to the farrowing house and by the time you get it back, it's froze up and it won't work. You know, it's one of the built-in problems of our industry that there isn't any way I can tell you to solve the problem except be aware of it. Now, usually you can reach in with a screwdriver and flip the fan blades and break the, the, the frost loose and get it rolling. Once you get it rolling, get air produced, it'll pick it up and start heating and heat itself up and everything will be all right. But that first start off in the morning when the guy calls you and says, I got a brand new heater and it won't start, you know the trouble's got to be a frozen rotor. And frozen rotor doesn't mean it's going to be frozen forever. Now, why don't we, uh, just so everybody has a chance, you, each of you have a, a compressor, we call this a motor compressor unit. And let's take it apart, just, just for, the sa for the heck of it. You guys take it apart. I want to show you a few things on it that might, might help you in the future. Now I think for the, uh, for the taping, uh, Dave, I think if you take one of the tables with the guys taking it apart and focused on it, you know, it, it, it might help your presentation. Now, the first thing, let me tell you about an air compressor, about any piece of equipment. If you look at this unit real carefully before you start, you'll see that there's certain things on it that will help you put it back together correctly. 
you know, there, there's, there's certain ways of identifying what you're doing. Is something missing off of it? Where's the spring off of it? Well, you got to remember, you know, that we're talking about modern stuff, not stuff that was made 15 years ago. <laughs> now, how, how do you know? Let's, let's think about the process of, of repairing a heater. First of all, when, 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 you, when you have that uh, heater brought to you and you're going to overhaul it, the guy doesn't necessarily, in, 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 your, fi in your place of business, want it just fixed. They, they want it overhauled. They want it right, you know. Making a heater right, you know, it's like I often say, if I take my van in to have it serviced or, or tuned up, I don't want the guy to change spark plugs and say $50. I want him to check my front end alignment. I want him to check the transmission. I want him to check the, uh, uh, the Freon in my, my air conditioner. I, I want my car tuned up. I want it from one end to the other because when I get on that car and drive 500 miles, I just want to be sure that it's going to go 500 miles without any problems, right? Same way with heaters. If that man brings you a heater, you should not just assume that the rotors are fine and don't assume that the filters are fine. You take it apart and you replace the rotor and the veins, you know, it's just good, a good policy to do it. And if you just grab a hold of it, it'll see it, it just lifts right up. Turn it upside down, dump it off. Now, I've been asked, how much wear does the veins need to be worn before they should be replaced? See, in your type of repair station, worn a little bit is enough. In other words, the man wants the heater to be perfect, you give it back to him perfect. Now, if it's a brand spanking new heater and you're doing a warranty repair, that's a different story. I'm talking about a guy who brings a heater in that's three years old or two years old or five years old. Take his compressor apart and give it and fix him up with a new rotor and new veins, and you know that the compressor is going to work right. Now, furthermore, you know you you have a compressor ring. Take the ring off the motor and feel inside the the race, and the, that race should be absolutely slick. If there's any serrations or wear on it, you ought to replace it, because the the rotor riding inside this race with the with the veins touching that face is what makes it compressed air, okay? Now the thing we had yesterday that we talked about so much was the faceplate of the motor. This faceplate should have no wear on it. If it's worn, and I've seen them worn as high as a 32nd of an inch, you should replace the motor unit. You can't replace the, fa the, the side plate. We don't sell it as a part. Now the reason we don't sell it as a part is that the average person working in the average shop making the average income, cannot afford the time it takes to take that motor apart, replace the bearings, which you have to do, and replace the end plate and put it back together for what we can sell the unit for, do you for. <coughs> and the alignment, you know, has got to be right so that it runs nice and smooth. And uh, the fellows yesterday just absolutely could not understand that. They wanted to be able to buy every part on the, on the heater so that if it needs just just a bearing, they could put just a bearing in it. Now my answer to that was, and, I, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, I went to 24 stores and I looked in 24 service uh, centers and what I saw was stacked up. I saw tractors and snow blowers and generators and uh, uh, sharp block uh, Briggs and Stratton engines. I saw all kinds of work that you guys are doing. And what you don't need to do is something that don't need doing. Don't take it apart. Okay. Are you with me? Everybody understand that? S simple. 
but true. Now, the other part that uh, I need to show you is that you have an in intake green filter. Now, that filter really never needs replacing. It always needs washing. You wash it with just a mild detergent and water and then dry it off on a, on a paper towel and replace it. No oil, absolutely no oil. And never any oil in the compressor unit. It's a dry running unit and should always run dry. Oil will go goof it up real quick. Now, of course, a lot of them that they bring to you, I saw one in one of the stores, didn't have a filter on it. It's been taken off and chucked a long time ago. I, I guess I've been a hero more times about, about that little green filter than anything else because what I do, if I'm around a guy's heater, if I'm going out and checking the, a, a fairing operation and he, I see his heater's running, and no matter if it's ours or ready heaters or Nipco's or whoever, they all always have an intake filter, and I see the heater's running just a little bit cool. The front of that heater should be just cherry white hot. I take his filter out and take it out in the, in the, in the bathroom and wash it and put it back in, and the heater is really picks up the guy says, man, you are, you know your business. Isn't that simple? But you know, usually if you've got to hear your neighbor's lawnmower running and it's running kind of half-heartedly, if you go over and say, let me show you something, you take the oil filter off of it, clean it out with a little gasoline, put a little more oil on it and put it back in, it goes, vroom, he says, man, that's great, you're really a mechanic. <laughs> you're not a mechanic, you're just doing what the book said you should do anyway, right? I owned a lawn boy lawnmower. One of the finest lawnmowers I ever used, but it got where you couldn't start the darn thing. And I did everything to it I could think of to make it work. And I went down to the lawnmower guy, and I said, you're going to have to help me. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. He said, oh, that's simple. Took the blade off, removed the muffler on the bottom, which I didn't know was there. And there was three ports, and those three ports was the exhaust ports for the engine. That's a two-cycle engine. And, of course, they were clogged up. So I cleaned them out with a, looked like a tongue depressor, you know. And he put it all back together, took about three minutes, charged me $20. He said, that's for ignorance. I said, thanks, you know. <laughs> Vroom, <laughs> away she goes. Now on, on, the, 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 on, on all of our little heaters, we have two filters. You have the, the green filter, and then on the adjustment side, you have a, a, a felt filter and the white filter, and now that white filter, fellas, you cannot clean. You chuck it and replace it. But these three pieces, uh, in some cases, comes in a little blister pack, stapled together. Sometimes the brass isn't there. Yeah, I think it all depended on who was doing it at that day, you know. If she thought that you ought to have the brass, she stapled that to it, you know. Some have the best, but these are the two things that are important to, to replace, those, those, those two filters. Those filters are the catching of the, of the wear and tear of the rotor and, and, the, and the vanes. That's what it's catching. That's what all that black on there is. Now, another spot that most of our people don't really realize is there's a... a Crescent wrench. There he is. There's a nothing but a little ball check valve in the air adjustment area, and I always check it. In other words, if you take it out, it's nothing but a, a little spring and a and a BB or a ball bearing, and I just take it out and clean it, make sure that the that the little nylon race on the inside is clean, just so it seats. If, if it doesn't seat, if there's dirt or anything inside or that's rusty, then you can't adjust the air to the nozzle. Uh, you know, that, 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 that's, that's the secret, that the low spring and that low ball bearing. That's why we get so much money for them. But I, all I do is do just what I just did. I take it out and roll it around in my hand, look at it, don't oil it, you know, put it back together and then when you put your air gauge on the unit, uh, that's when you start turning it down to get the air pressure that you need to the nozzle. Now, let me show you something else. You know, we have little air gauges. We sell these air gauges, by the way. And you know that when you hook up your air gauge, you uh, turn it in good and tight, right?
and you set your pressure. Now, I personally, and this is only a personal recommendation, I personally recommend that you recommend to your customer that you put in a gauge and you leave it in for him. Because this is his one single point of adjustment that he can do if he has the proper way of doing it. And if you say to him, now you got that heater, if I put this gauge in and, you know, hit him whatever you need to hit him for, $8 or whatever it is, and just tell him now from now on, you look at that gauge, and if it doesn't say, like if this came off of the, the 40,000, it doesn't say four and a half pounds, you simply turn this screw until you get four and a half pounds, and that heater will work fine a lot longer instead of just eyeballing. Are you with me? I, I always do it, and I never, you know, especially see, when I'm working on a, a heaters, usually it's a rental store or a contractor's equipment house where I work on a heater to teach a mechanic what to look for. And when I'm doing that, I tell them, you know, about this gauge and how to do it, and they put it on their own rental fleet. Now, they put them on their own rental fleet so that when the heater comes back from a rental, they simply check, they take their, their tester and test the fuel, make sure that the guy that was using it puts the right fuel in it, and, and then plugs it in and checks the pressure. And if that pressure is good and, and holds steady and the fuel is right, the heater's running pretty decent, he, they can send it out on the next rental the next hour, right? Very simple. Instead of screwing something out and screwing something in all, every time, they just leave the, 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 the gauge in there. We sell gauges by the carload. And I think it, now, there was a time about 11 years ago when our manufacturers put gauges in and left them in. We had, every heater had a gauge on it. If you notice, the big 320 has a gauge on it. See? But our competitors took the gauge off. And every time a competitor takes something off, you have to take it off because you've got to be competitive. You can't be there to say to the customer, you really need to spend $6 more because that gauge because you're not there to tell him, right? And he sees yours is $150 and his is $139. He'll go buy the $139 unit because it's cheaper. He doesn't know that it's got a gauge or anything else. Any questions so far? <coughs> The, uh, the heart of the heater, as you look at it, is what you have in your hands. The, uh, the main working parts is right there in that compressor and, uh, and motor unit. But now let's get to the nozzle holder. And the nozzle holder can be equally as, as frustrating. You know, on the, uh, on the little 40,000 and the 55, if, if you take the nozzle out, and you notice I've had these out already, it's got a little tiny O-ring on the end of the nozzle. If that O-ring is worn or nicked, you know, or, or it's been compressed too long, it won't, it, it, its memory won't let it come back out, it won't let it suck fuel. If you have a heater that everything seems to check out and it's just not putting out fuel right, usually it's that O-ring. And that O-ring is not in your book. We don't sell that as a part because we know that you got a whole basket full of them on your shelf and why it's charge you five dollars for a two cent o-ring right but look for the o-ring the o-ring is very very important to you the nozzle can be uh no uh, it can be well i had a big guy like you on it yesterday and he put it together but you can take the nozzles apart we don't really advise it but you can take them apart and blow clean them. Don't ever put a, 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 a wire cleaner, you know, or, or dig around on them. You just goof them up. The best part, of course, is if you clean them and you put them together and it works fine. If you clean them and put them together, don't work, put a new nozzle on it. That's your best bet. Now, if you notice the 100 and the 150, and this is cutaway, it will show you. Now you have the, the nozzle and then behind it there's a rubber grommet. And that rubber grommet probably has frustrated more people than anybody anything else on that heater. If that rubber grommet's not is not sealing, it won't suck fuel. Now I've had people bring me heaters that they have themselves worked on and couldn't get started and found out that they had removed that spring and grommet and not even put it back in. Oh, I don't need that, you know. 
So, you know, that's, that's the spot to look for. Whenever you're looking, look for that, because that's going to give you the troubles. Another thing is that from, that, uh, from the copper tubing going down into the tank, and I didn't bring one with me because you could see if later on you could come take a look. There, there is a screen filter on the intake fuel uh, tube going down into the tank. Now, theoretically, as this heater runs, when you stop it, it back flushes itself. The fuel that's in the copper tubing goes back down and knocks the dirt off of that filter, theoretically. But many times, you'll have to pull it out and it'll be so cruddy and full of rust and junk that that it, you know, you'll just have to replace it instead of blowing it because you just can't get it clean enough. Those are the, some of the things that you run into on the heater that's going to create problems for you. Now we're talking about the inline low pressure heaters. The, uh, I guess the, the, the one of the main things for you young fellas who haven't worked on too many is you've got to put at least two gallons of fuel in that tank if you're going to make the heater run right. You know, if you put a quart in or two pints or three pints, and you wonder why it don't work. It's not working because you ain't got no fuel. I, and I've run into that more, I guess, than any other single innocent thing that people do because they think, well, we don't want to put a whole lot of fuel in it. You got to put at least two gallons in for it to pick up. I like to fill the tank. Now, I got a little old, uh, little giant transfer pump that I use that I pump from a 55-gallon drum into the heater that I'm working on. I fill the tank up, always fill it up. And the reason I do it, I want to see if there's any leaks in the tank. You know, that's part of my business, right? If I'm going to give him back his heater, why well, give him back one that runs good that the fuel runs out of? So I fill it up. <clears throat> but now when I get done with the heater, I transfer it back into my 55-gallon drum. I don't give it back to him full of fuel. It costs too much. Now, if he's got bad fuel in the, in, in the unit and I have to dump it, I usually try to put it into something where part of it I give back to him and show him what kind of crud he's got in his tank and, and what you had to do because if he goes back and fills it out of the same old tank, you're going to get the same old problem and everybody's going to be teed off at you, right? Yesterday they brought up a point that I guess we ought to discuss a little bit. The point was it costs so much to repair heaters. You know, that motor assembly and that compressor costs so much that sometimes it's embarrassing to tell a guy you're going to have to spend $85 or $95 or $100, you know. Uh, and I know in the repair business we run into that where this little poor old man driving that little old poor 57 Chevrolet pickup truck and he limps in and he says, my heater ain't working very good. Now, you don't know that the guy's worth $15 million. See? And he wouldn't hire somebody to carry that heater because his life depended on it. And he says, my God, I can't afford that. I've heard my uncle, my uncle's got 860 acres of cotton. You know what that means? A million bucks a year in cotton, just cotton. That's not counting all the black Angus cattle he's got running. You know, it's not counting his hog operation, his chicken ranch that's 1,000 foot long. You know, he's got four great big greenhouses where they grow tomatoes. You know, that doesn't count all that. That's just cotton. And he was telling me one day here about two years ago how sad it was that he was losing money because the price of beef had went down from, from like 50 cents a pound down to 30 cents a pound and he lost, he had figured on his little calculator, $35,000 that week. And I said, Uncle Ben, let me ask you a question now, you know, just how many cows you got? Oh, I got 268 registered Black Angus. And I said, you do? He said, yeah. I said, where'd you get them? Oh, he said, I bought 12 in a bull, 12 uh, uh, heifers in a bull back about 15 years ago, and I've just been raising them ever since. And I said, you mean to tell me that you bought 12, 13 head of cattle, and today you got 268? It's just from reproducing? You mean to tell me that? And he said, yeah. And I said, and now you're losing money? You know, that's the way people think, right? Now, what I'm getting to is, they can't get their heater repaired any cheaper anywhere else. Those parts don't cost any cheaper any place else. They, if they have you do it or if they have John Doe do it down the street, it's going to cost them the same. Don't be ashamed of it. That's just the cost of operation. They don't want that heater because they want to keep their hands warm. They want that heater to keep sows warm and little piggies, right? You know, uh, just, just tell them. And if they raise hell, you know, what we do in my shop, if a guy says to me, and first of all, what you do, let's, let's go through it. You've got to 
worksheet and you say, well, sir, now when I repair a heater, I'm going to put new vanes and a new rotor on that, and I'm going to put a new filter in, and I'm going to et cetera, et cetera, then your approximate cost is going to run you somewhere around 80 bucks. And he says, well, I can't afford it. I say, well, sir, sorry. That's it. If the vehicle signed the ticket and let you do the work right, you shouldn't do it, right? If he says, oh, j just put a new filter on it. The way the law runs today, I wouldn't put a new filter on it. Just a new filter. I just wonder if I should get in deeper into some of these things. Anybody I got any questions? I am seem to be doing all the talking today, and this ain't the way it's been the last three days. <laughs> if you got any questions, now the time to ask. Yeah, now we, what we want you to do is just, just be uh, open about it. If you've got any, any complaints, any problems that you run into, anything that you, that you don't think is right, we want to talk about it. This is the time to do it, you know. Uh, you got there are uh, 100,000 BTU that you have right there. And uh, it, uh, just, you've got good air pressure. Air pressure is all right. The field is clean and you fuel. And it just, just starts to pulsating. Pulsating. It comes on and goes off and comes on. Uh, that could be in that their, uh, nozzle. That's that rubber grommet. Rubber grommet in the back of the nozzle. Yeah. Uh, Either that or the nozzle is very, very dirty. No, the nozzle is clean. See. The yeah. Clean. Now you can take that rubber grommet out and look at it, and it looks good. Have you found that? You, you can look at it, it looks good, and you put it back in the heater, and if the spring is not tensioned enough, and it's not seating, it won't, it, 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 it'll suck, and then it'll lose its, its, its prime, I call it, and, and spit and sputter, and then it'll fire up again and run real good for a few minutes, and then it just loses its prime. That's what, that's what I call it. You want, can you add anything to that, Francis? Yeah, if you have a guy that ha has an old one and it's really bad, really terribly bad, the new replacement module will go on, will fit. You know, another thing that I should mention about the 40, you know, since we had so much trouble with it, if, uh, if any of you had any, any problems, I know you've had problems with it, but we used a piece of cardboard and a very thin motor clamp when we first made this heater and, and not taking into consideration that you put it in a box and the box goes into a, a freight car and the freight car goes 99 miles an hour down the track and all of a sudden they stop it, wham, you know, and then they start off, wham, you know, and by the time it got to the, to the store and you guys took it out and you plugged it in, it goes bling, 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 bling. And what would happen was that the motor would shift backwards and there's a crossbar and that fan motor just, that fan would just beat the hell out of itself. Now, we've solved the problem by, of course, putting a, a better clamp on it and, a, and a, a piece of cark that keeps it from shifting. The cark originally was put there so that under vibration that it wouldn't move. That's the only reason for it. But through shipping, and I, you had this in all new products, shipping can cause problems that you never expected, right? So if you have one that, that, that the guy's fan is beat up because the motor shifted, put him on a new fan, make sure that, that you got, just cut a little piece of cork and put it underneath the motor. That's all you need to do to keep it from shifting and, and uh, enter a warranty repair claim and we'll be glad to pay it. As a matter of fact, let me put it to you this way. If you have a guy that's got an old 40 and it comes in, do whatever you need to do to make the heater run absolutely perfect for him and charges. Now our warranty claim, uh, warranty uh, agreement with Quality Farm and Fleet is that we will have a two hour maximum uh, re labor repair per heater or per condition. Uh, and I think that any heater that's in the world could be taken apart and put together in two hours. You know, a guy knows how to use a screwdriver. Uh, and we're up to now $8 an hour that we, we pay back to your company for those warranty repair claims. We was down as low as four, and then we went to six, now we're at eight, you know. 
Someday we're going to get it up where it should be, and it should be shop labor. But I don't make those policies. I just let on you, right? Now, that might bring up a thing that, that I should say to you because you're going to hear a lot about it. We don't really worry about warranty claims. We, you know, we, Champion Manufacturing, Champion Heater Company, we tell people to fix things. We tell them to do this year in and year out. And we figure we get about 12% of the warranty, actual warranties out of companies. And the only reason we don't get more than that is that the average mechanic does not fill out warranty repair claims. There's something about it that they just don't like to do it. It's like salesmen filling out call reports. You know, I had highest, my biggest crew was, was 57 salesmen, and I wanted itineraries from them, what they're going to do for the next three weeks, and I also wanted daily call reports. I'd even hold up their salaries to try to get reports and couldn't get them. And I got to a point where I knew certain people was not going to write reports. I either had to do one of two things. I either had to live with that or fire them. Because nothing else was going to solve the problem. You know, if they were a good enough salesman, they never got fired, right? It reminds me of a story. Can I tell a story on this thing? Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this, uh, the salesman was, you know, he, he was a pretty good, uh, pretty good salesman, pretty hot shot. And uh, uh, he took his territory and doubled his business one year, and he doubled the following year, and he doubled the following year, and they were in a sales meeting. And the vice president was down up there, and he was really reading the riot act. You're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and you're going to do this. And he stood up, and he held up his hands, and the, guy said, the vice president said, yes. He says, go fuck yourself. He said, you can't say that to me. I'm the vice president. He said, I just said it. He said, I'm going to tell the president. He said, he can go shit in his hat and walked out the door. So the vice president ran out, got over the president and said, you know what, you know what Gene Volker said to me? He told me to go fuck myself. And he said, and I told him I was going to tell you, and he said, you go shit in your hat. And the president said, well, what has he done? He said, well, he's just tripping his business three years in a row. He said, well, I can get a new hat. because you, buddy, you got a sex problem. <laughs> <laughs> You, you're going to cut that part out, aren't you? <laughs> I always told that Ben's not here because, see, Ben's got to really get on you about writing warranty reports. But that's true. We, we really don't worry too much about warranties. It's like putting warranties in consumer products. The, the manufacturer knows that if, if uh, let's say, hair dryers, yeah, if they put out 50,000 bad hair dryers, they're liable to get 200 of them back. The other ones that go wrong, they th you know, throw it in the corner or out in the garage someplace and go buy a new hair dryer. When they could really send the, hair, oh, the bad hair dryer back and get a new hair dryer. You know, people don't do it. Should do it. It's like I get on my wife. I, I got a, in a, on a kick here about a year ago about these coupons. I read about these gals that, that save half of their food bill with coupons. You know, clipping coupons. I said to my wife, why in the hell don't you clip coupons? I never see you take a coupon. She said, I don't like them. I ain't going to do it, you know. Well, I just like I can get a new hat, you know. <laughs> you had a good enough wife, you don't worry about the damn coupons, right? OK, me, back to the, meanwhile, back to the heaters. <laughs> get carried away there. <laughs> no, I'm all right. If you're all right. Now, if any of you guys feel like standing up or going to get a cup of coffee, do it. Just get up and go do it, you know. We're not, we're not that regimented around here today. We're not supposed to be, you know. Not, not, I got to think about all the things I should tell you because about the third day of this, I kind of forget where it is exactly I'm at, right? And then I got to go back and think now, did I tell you about that? You know, like, like the, the motor mounts on the, on the 40,000. The 40,000, by the way, with all the trouble, has been a darn good seller. We sell a lot of 40,000 BTUs. It's a good heater, works good. Uh, when it's, you know, like 20 out of, out of 25 will go out and you never hear from them. The five will give you fix, okay? The, uh, the 100 and the 151 really is, is not 
any single problem at all when it comes to the new units. Now, where Quality Farm and Fleet, I find, is very, very different than everybody else I work with in the retail store business is that, see, you guys repair heaters no matter who sold them or when. In other words, they're going to get a heater that's 20 years old. You've got to work on it, right? It's your business to work on it. And most retail-type operations will only work on what would be a warranty repair claim at that year. If it's a year later, you take it to an authorized service station someplace else, and you're not concerned with it. True? And so because of that, we have to give you service meetings that are a little different than, than what we would give a guy that's just working on warranty repair problems. This heater, in the last five years, I haven't had any warranty repair problems on the 100 and the 150. My warranty repair problems on Champion Heaters has been the 40,000. That's been my big headache. But some of the, 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 the things that I look for on a, on a heater, like as an example, the electrical system. Now here we had another discussion. I say that there is no weak transformers. I say that transformers are either good or bad. Either they're, they have life or they're dead. If you, if, if you take a transformer out of a 100,000 BTU heater and you can get a weak spark from it, usually the transformer is okay, but there's a wiring connection someplace that's, that's weak, that's not giving it proper voltage. Now, of course, Cletus yesterday said, if it, it can be weak and you'll never make it fire, you know. But that was his opinion. And I said, well, what I do, if it's got life, I try to make it work. So to me, a good transformer is one that's working and a bad one, one that won't work at all. But let's talk about not working at all. You know, if you take the transformer out of this heater, you notice it's got a positive and a negative wire going to it and one wire going from it. That one wire is your spark plug wire, right? If that spark plug isn't firing, it doesn't mean all, always that the transformer is bad. But it could be, and it's a very simple thing, it could be the grounding of the heater. See. From the, the combustion chamber uh, back to that transformer, you've got to have a solid dead ground in order to make that heater, that transformer function with a good hot spark. And we went so far, uh, I don't know if we can show it on this one, as running a ground wire from the combustion chamber to the housing just to make sure that it, it's not, I took it off of this one because it's on top. But I, I do that in order to make a good, solid ground. If your ground is bad, you ain't going to get a good spark. Is that true? What yeah. you do when you take, uh, you got the transformer out, you hook your, lead, your power leads to it, and you uh, ground your plug right to the transformer, and you only get a weak spark. Then where's your trouble? Well, the only trouble then would be where that wire goes into the transformer. Well, but that's, that's your... It's a transformer trouble. Right? Yeah. If you as a mechanic decide that that would be the best thing for your customer, you should do it. And that's the way we're always motivated, right? If it's best for the customer or best for you. You know, one thing I hate to do is have something go out, come in to me, I repair it, and I know that I did it right, and it goes out and it comes back. It absolutely runs me bugs. I just can't stand it. <laughs> And if I knew I had a, a transformer that, that wasn't acting right for me and I couldn't make it act right, you know, I would also probably replace it. But that doesn't mean that that one that I'm replacing is bad. Now, let's say that I have got a hold of a guy that I know is a real penny pincher. And what are you talking about now, 35 bucks? Put a transformer in? You know, it runs that bill up. You know, now, if it's, you feel like it should be done, do it. But first, you've got to check out all your options. You check out your grounds, your connections, make sure that the spark plug's right, make sure that the little dialing's grounded right. Then when you get all that done, then you, you decide on the transformer. Now, something about the transformer that I might mention to you, just for your benefit. If you run into an old, old, old heater, let's say one 10 years old, and your new transformer looks like the old one, but the base plate is different. Do you know you can take four little screws off and take the base plate off of the old one and put it on the new one? Did you know that? The transformers themselves, it hasn't changed enough in the last 20 years to spit at. 
that the base plates change, the mounting plates change. It's like the transformer on a, on a air scoop heater. They've changed in, in looks, and sometimes they've changed in the hinges, but the transformer itself, that little black box hasn't changed. It's the same old stuff that we put on, you know, 25 years ago. But if you've got that heater in and you've got to have that base, what do you do with it? You know, it, re it really can throw you, can't it? But if you can take four little screws off, and I can show you the screws, you can take that transformer and put it on the old base. The base ain't going to do nothing but mount it for you. Yeah. Now that's not, let me repeat that, that's, that is not altering a heater. You're using the right transformer on the right heater. You're simply changing the base plate, which came with the heater. You're not altering the damn thing, right? But if you took a champion transformer and put on a ready heater and changed the base plate, that's, that's when the law can get a little bit sticky. Now, I'm not going to tell you not to put a champion on a ready heater, but I sure as hell don't want you putting a ready heater on a champion. Right? I don't make any money on that ready heater. <laughs> not a penny. Uh, I guess the, 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 the biggest single problem that you'll have on heaters is going to be uh, the problem of fuel. We've labored that enough, and we do it every year. But just for the new men, let me repeat that if you take fuel out of that tank and it's got a yellow color to it, and it's darker the yellow, the worse the fuel, you've got to tell the customer because you can't correct this problem. It'll just repeat itself and repeat itself and repeat itself. It's one of the toughest parts of our business is to teach people that if it says 25 to 1 mixture to run that, that pole and saw, it's got to be 25 to 1 and not 30 to 1 or not 20 to 1, right? It's got to be 25 to 1. You want it right. You want your saw to last. You do it right. And the biggest problem you have, like, you know, I, I've got a, an Echo gasoline edger. Love my edger. You know, I really take good care of my stuff. I mix the fuel correctly and I got the fuel by, can for my edger. My son-in-law borrows my edger. Brings it back and he says, hey, Dad, it ain't, ain't really worth it. How much you get for that piece of junk? And, and I said, hey, that piece of junk, that's a very fine two-cycle engine. I should have said it was a fine two-cycle engine. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he, he didn't put straight gas in it, no. He, <laughs> he had about a 10 to 1 mixture in it. Oh. I, I jokingly, you know, not, not knowing that Ben was Polish and Catholic, I, I made a statement the other day. I said, my daughter did fine for me. She's a wonderful, obedient, sweet girl. Then she married a guy that was half Italian, half Polish and Catholic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am, a German Presbyterian, you know. You, it's bad, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now, we're going to go into those a little further later on when we get a little looser, but between now and lunch, we've got to cover, and we've got an hour and a half to do, we've got to cover all the oil heaters, because after lunch, we go into propane. Everybody here that knows me for over a year have heard the story about air scoop heaters, and I repeat it, and I repeat it, and I repeat it, and I repeat it, because it tells the story, and if you remember the story that an air scoop heater is a, is a portable furnace, It'll make you understand how the heater works and why it works and, and, and will help you work on the heater a lot easier. And the story is that our engineer, when this heater was built originally, uh, th there was only inline heaters built. And the inline heaters were all high pressure heaters. And every, every heater used, uh, all those heaters used the old Sunstrand uh, high pressure pump on them. The problem we had with building an inline heater where we use one motor to run the whole system and one fan to put combustion air into the combustion chamber as well as circulate the air, and that motor was to pull a big pump like this, was that how do you balance it to make it start without smoking and stop without smoking? And the smoking part was really goofed the heaters up. Now, in those days, there was a company called Master, which is now Coring, which is now Ready Heater. Uh, down in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, there was a company called Silent Glow over in New, New York. Uh, there was Champion Heater Company, a uh, company called Kelly, 
construction equipment, and all of them made the same identical type of heater. Now, sometimes they ran the, uh, they put a coupling and ran the pump off of the tail end of the motor. Sometimes they mounted on the side and put a belt on, belt driven. There's some today still built with the, with the belt driving the high pressure pump. And, and they're really bad because they don't operate uh, without smoking. They smoke like hell. Silent Glow, that's the stone company, has made the same damn heaters ever since we've been in the heater business and never changed a thing on them. But they don't sell very many heaters, of course. You pro fellas probably have never, never seen one of them, you know. Uh, but the story is that we, we looked at all these heaters and they all had the same problems. They all malfunctioned, they all smoked, and they all uh, had to be worked on like every other day to make them, keep them running. And I told our engineer I wanted a heater that was better than those. I wanted a better mousetrap. I didn't want the same old junk. I, I just get sick and tired of selling the same as. I, I want something different. So it took him about six months to come up with what I'm holding on right now. And this was 22 years ago. And it built Cooper's story for you young men who haven't heard this story. His story was that in desperation, he had given up. He said he'd looked at all these heaters and how else do you build them? You know, that's it, you know. And uh, there was no aspirator heaters in those days. That, that, that heater didn't come into being until 1962. And he said he heard his furnace come on and he went down to check his furnace out and his furnace had a Wayne burner on it. And he identified the fact that a Wayne burner has a squirrel cage fan in it with this, with this stretch. Let me prop it up here and so you can see it. If you look inside of a Wayne burner, what you, what, what you see, and we'll take this apart in a minute, but you see a squirrel cage fan and a motor to run it and a high pressure pump on the other side and a draw assembly and what you actually have is an automatic blowtorch. If we were to take that Wayne burner off that heater and set it up on the table and put a, a, a supply of fuel uh, connected to it, and plugged in the wall, out the front comes a blowtorch. He said he looked at it and it looked good. And, and by golly, uh, uh, you know, that, that answered part of his question, how to make a heater that didn't smoke, because it, it was, hell, this thing's been made for a hundred years, you know. And he ran up and turned the thermostat up, and when he did, he went back downstairs, and as the fire came on, he looked down, you know, you look down at the side hole, and it burned nice and pretty, and, and if, First thing you know, something else started to work, and a blower started blowing. Now, at your home, you have a blower on your furnace, don't you? See, a blower and the furnace are two separate pieces of equipment. Bill Cooper then came back to his office and put a Wayne burner on a combustion chamber and put a fan on top of it, and we patented the fan. And the fan made Bill Cooper a million dollars, this fan. We patented a blower fan on a portable oil-fired heater, and there's nobody can copy it. It's a good standard, solid patent. Simple too, isn't it? Because see, all furnaces, all commercial and, and, and residential furnaces were made that way. Now, run through it with me, if you will. You turn the heater on, and when you turn the heater on, the fire comes on. Now, it's, it's making a fire by using high pressure. That means that it pulls the fuel from the tank and puts it into a geared pump where it increases the pressure from zero to a, 100 pounds per square inch and then forces it through a predetermined size nozzle which makes a combustible gas out of it. Then you have two electrodes that fire the fuel. Now the fire comes on and it burns and then there's a switch up in the front end that when it gets to 105 degrees Come off you rascal! This little switch, when it gets to 105 degrees, says I'm hot, and it turns the fan on. Now, your furnace at home does identically the same thing. Now, in reverse, when you turn the unit off, the fan continues to blow, but the fire goes out. The can fan continues to blow until it cools that switch below 105, and it shuts itself off. The second little switch, the one with the red dot on it, is a high heat limit switch. On your furnace at home, if you if you have a fan blow motor go out or the belt breaks or anything happens uh, you know to that fan
that heated that furnace to get up to a certain degree, usually 300 degrees, and it shuts itself off. Safety. That's what that little red dot does. Now, it's a simple, easy heater to understand. It's not a hard heater to work on. There are just certain things about it, that the, the idiosyncrasies of a heater that, that you have to know. And our only big problem now is that if this had a combustion chamber sealed and a, and a, and a stack on it that run out of doors, you'd never have any problems. But we've got to burn 99.6% in order not to have any odors. And if this heater has several things wrong with it, it will smoke and it will have odors. This is what we, we combat. Now, the, the, the biggest single problem that you have is on the filter. You know, people don't change filters. I've had, I've had men brag to me. I've run that car 40,000 miles and never changed the filter. It runs like a stripe at eight. Yeah. And I think, boy, that's, that's good, isn't it? You know, I need to be the second owner. <laughs> It's going to be bad. But we have a little filter on this unit, and uh, uh, it, it's a simple filter. And I bet I can show some of you guys something that you've been in the heaters all your life and you didn't know. You know, it's got a little screw on top of it, and that little screw is what we call a vibration lock screw. Now, you've got to back the screw off before you take the filter off of it. If you don't, you'll, you'll screw up the thread. In the last two days, it just amazed Ben and I that uh, half of the guys didn't know that it had a lock screw. And so what they did, they take, the, you got a, a wrench in here. It's the one with the chain on it. One of them's got it. Most of them will, 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 will take that pipe wrench and make the filter come off. And you can make it come off, you know. When you get done with it, of course, it's kind of screwed up. But our, our, uh, our standard problem <sighs> on a high pressure pump unit, if it can suck air from the time the, the fuel leaves the tank till the time it gets to the nozzle, you will have odors are odors and smoke. If you ever have a unit that when you shut it off, it smokes back through the air vents, you got an air leak. It's sucking air. When I just took this off, you notice it's just a flat top on it. But on, on the flat top, if you look up further, there is an O-ring. And on every new filter you got in your store, it comes with an O-ring in a little plastic bag in the box with the filter. You've got to change the O-ring. If you don't change the O-ring, and the old O-ring is compressed, and it's not sealing, and it sucks air, your heater will have a lot of odors. Did you know that? The O-ring is, is very important, and yet I've had guys tell me time and again, oh, I didn't change the O-ring. Hell, it had it all went on. I didn't have to change it, you know. I said, well, what do you think we give you a new O-ring with every filter for? It's not just because we're generous. It's because we know you need it. You need to change it. Filters should be changed at least once each season. And if you, if you, uh, in your area of, of operation, when you have a guy bring a heater to you, if it, that heater's over two months old, the first thing you do is sell him a new filter. Just put a new filter on it. Don't, don't argue with him. Don't talk to him. Just say, you got to have a new filter before I work on it because it's going to need it. What happens, these are not shut off filters. When they get full of dirt, they simply bypass. And the filter hangs on there full of dirt. And the first real cold morning, like you have out here now, that filter freezes up. As soon as that filter freezes up, your heater stops working because it'll shut off the fuel. OK? Now, the reason for that little gadget is really so that under vibrations, when the motor's running, the fan's a little bit out of whack, that it doesn't vibrate the, the, the canister loose. That's all it's there for. When you put it back up, you can see the, where, it, where it's been seated. Now, from that point, yeah, I'm going to leave that off. We'll let somebody else put it back on. 
From that point, we go into the, the pump unit, and, that, and this is where it, you can get really, really confused. This is the latest pump that we furnish on the Wayne Burner. It's the A1VA7012, and this year, Wayne's changed something. We don't, I don't know what it is. I haven't found out what it is, but it's a 7912. You'll see that on the... On the, on the the one thing you want to watch for, always watch for on the heater you're repairing, is that the, if you take off a 1725 RPM pump, you've got to put a 1725 RPM back. About five years ago, there was a, one of our brilliant engineers, the Champion Heater Company, that, that decided, well, the way he tells it, the Wayne Burner salesman told him that they made a high-speed pump, a high-speed burner, that the high-speed burner would burn number two fuel oils, and he should use the high-speed burner on his units. Without telling anybody, he bought 500 of them. Now, if you look at it, it looks the same, like the same burner, but it's a 3450 RPM, and it's got a different rotation. When you run into that, you call Ben. You can't get Ben. You got my card. You call me. We get you the proper pump. The chances of you running into wine, of course, is slim, but you know, you, you're going to be running into a lot of things that you won't. But we don't, you know, we have that in your parts book, the high speed burner in your parts book, but we don't talk much about it. We're not very proud of the fact that we'd have somebody do that. That's kind of dumb. Now, the pump is, is designed. Now, you notice when we took the air compressor apart, you had a rotor and you had veins. Through centrifugal force, it throws those veins out against the face of that race and squeezes the air and compresses air and puts it through a port. You understand that? It's a very simple thing. If you looked at the inside of this pump, it does the same thing except it does it with gears. A gear runs in a gear and picks up air, uh, oil and squeezes it and runs it through a port. It's what we call a constant displacement three gallon an hour high pressure pump, meaning that it's going to run three gallons of oil through it per hour, regardless of what you do with it. Now we use, like using, using what I told you in the beginning, 140,000 BTUs, we use 85% of a gallon in this heater. So you got two gallons, 2.15, gallons going back into the tank that you don't need and it goes back through the return port. That's what that pipe underneath means. This is the return line. What you have to look for uh, is that when you get a new pump, up inside that port is, is a, a fine thread secondary port. And in the pump box will be a little tiny Allen screw that you must put in that hole. You must plug that hole. I've had a lot of guys call me and say, I put three new pumps on that heater and none of them work. Well, I know what's wrong, see. And I said, if you put the little bypass nut in, what the hell are you talking about? Well, go back and get the original pump and look in port, you know, it's just like this. Look, look at the end of the pump and it's the right hand port on the bottom and you'll see it, take it out and put it in your new pump. Oh, gee, I didn't know it was there. I got those that laying on my bench. I just threw them away. Now, for your information, there are applications for this pump in commercial heating where they use this without the nut in it, without that in it. It's a two-stage type burner. I don't even get into it. Don't want to know about it, you know. Okay? Now, there's a one thing you can do on this pump that you should always do. Take those four screws out there. Out. Take it out of yours. You got the small pump? Yeah, dirt, crud, water, all kinds of things is going to get into your systems, and I think this will show you something that maybe you hadn't gotten into. Let me explain why you take it apart. You do not overhaul high-pressure pumps. Sunstrand will not sell Champion Heater Company parts for that pump. They have their own authorized repair stations and their own, own overhaul stations, and they won't even talk to us about it. 
So when we, you know, we have guys, we had one yesterday that just insisted that he ought to be able to overhaul pumps. And I said, then what I would advise you to do is get a hold of Sunstrand Direct and ask to be uh, uh, an authorized repair station, and they'll come in and tell you how many thousands of dollars in test equipment you're going to have to buy to do that, you know. And now, if you notice when you pull it off, you have a small fine wire filter. On a sun now, that's as far as you want to go on disassembling that pump as far as the working parts of that pump is concerned. Now, you can take it apart as you see it there, clean it up, wash it out. If you take it apart and it's as rusty as you see that one, it should be replaced and, and, and just don't worry about it. Just put a new pump on it because it's got a lot of rust in it and you, you can bet the rust is all the way down into the rotors and, okay? Now, amazingly enough, they won't even sell us the, fill, the, the gasket. You, and you've got to have that gasket. We use Permatex, our liquid gasket. And as long as you're conscious of the fact when you put it back on that you have a... Uh, can you see that? A side port that you've got to keep open. you'll be in good shape. See that side port? You've got to keep that open. You've got to keep that port open. But that's where the fuel's flowing. You've got to keep that port open. But So when you Permatex it, you've got to be very, very careful with the Permatex. But of course, you've got to seal it to put it back together. The second place that you, you will run into trouble is that you'll have a pump, and it'll be relatively new, and you can't get it to hold pressure. Now, the, these, these units, are built with a pressure regulator almost the same as that air compressor. Uh, you want to pull that out of there? Oh, it's almost built like it. What you're doing is you're restricting the fuel going back to the tank and making the fuel go to the nozzle, okay? And if a, some dirt gets into that rotor, uh, it, it can it, it, it can very possibly keep your adjustment sleeve from moving freely. And if it doesn't move freely, then of course you're not going to be able to hold a decent pressure. If you take it apart and it's really rusty and really bad, don't try to repair it. If you can't just clean it and put it back together, put it in a, you know in, in, in the return box and put a new pump on it. Don't take that off. Yeah. That, when you get, let me show them this. Uh, mm -hmm. You couldn't get it out of there? Now see, that, that, I think this would be a prime example of one that's past hope. That, that pump had been sitting and gotten so rusty and so bad that if you, if you own this personally and being a good mechanic, you could possibly polish it up and make it work. But you aren't doing this for yourself, you're doing it for a customer and you should put on a new pump on it. Let me reiterate, Sunstrand makes the policy that we can't work on pumps. You know, uh, they just say that we don't have the testing equipment, and we don't have the technology, we don't have the setup to do it, and we're not supposed to do it. 
So those two steps are the only two steps you take on a high pressure pump. You, you can clean that filter and you can try to clean the adjustment sleeve and that, when you get past that, stow it. Now up until uh, 1974, Sunstrand furnished Wayne with a pump and on the bottom of the pump it just says a, a J2CB-303 pump. It's probably the best pump we ever used. It was really a good pump. It, this pump worked like a dream and worked uh, for many years, but Sunstrand decided themselves that they weren't going to continue to produce it and uh, changed from this pump to that pump. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to get you off track, but you, if you have a heater come in with this pump on it and it needs a pump replacement, we can furnish you with this pump, but you also can put the uh, small pump on the unit. But it takes a little, little, little knowledge to do it. Um, if you notice that the, the races, this race and this race are the same, the whole distances are the same, but what you have to change on that burner is the uh, plastic coupling that couples the motor and the fan to the pump it has to be changed and you have to change the plumbing. In other words, as this one sets, you know, and you have your, uh, your return line and your intake line, and, uh, you know, it, they are not in the same positions that this one is, so you have to change all that. What we decided on, like Monday evening, is that if you run into a case where you need the old pump, we'll get you the old pump. We got them in St. Louis. We carry them in for replacement and uh, Sunstrand don't like it, but they've got to make them for 10 years. It's 1984. By then, we shouldn't have any problems anymore with it. But this pu pump, take, take those off too while you're, all those. This pump has about the same idiosyncrasies as a small one. I just liked it so much because it was the one we started with and it works the doggone good, you know? It was a good pump. It, it, you, you would have very few times when it gets so bad that it wouldn't hold the, the pressure. It had to get so bad that it just clog up solid before you couldn't hold pressure on it. The small pump, pump can get just a little bit finicky on you, if you all know, you know what I mean. Now, by the by, while I'm talking about this, if you have a guy bring a heater into you that's burned up, now when I say burned up, I mean burned up, and he says, boy, this heater burned up my barn or something, you then put it in a box or something and you hold it. Don't let nobody have it and don't let nobody tinker with it until the insurance people tell you to. Because inside that pump, that little... That little bit of fuel, no matter how bad that pump, that heater's burned, there'll be that much fuel left in that pump, and that is the only thing you have to show the court that he used the wrong fuel. Okay? Now, on the big pump, you got a, a little bit more. You got about a half pint that it that holds inside the pump that it will not burn up. It'll it'll be there, and that's what we use to show. Okay? We had one come back in St. Louis, this is a lot of years ago, and it was burned up, truly burned up. And what we do is that we get two attorneys and one engineer to stand over the mechanic as he takes the pump apart. So they can attest under oath that this is what came out of that pump. And what it was was pure airplane octane gasoline. And they wondered why it, did, it burned up. It could actually have blown the guy to smithereens instead of just burning, you know. He was just lucky. But when we took that AO pump apart, uh, the, and this, this cavity had the gasoline in it, and that's the way we proved, the, of course, they dropped the case. It just uh, hands down, no contest. Now, this is the filter on the big pump. See how much bigger it is? Really does a better job of catching the fuel. It, it was just a heck of a good pump. The inside working part of the pump is almost identical. The gear part of the pump, if you took these five off and or those four off, you'd see that they're almost, or the three off, there's three screws. 
Uh, the uh, the problem of the fuel has always been our big problem because you know after all a lot of these guys uh, that we deal with the uh, customers that we deal with just don't know the difference just simply doesn't know the difference and you can't get them to read an instruction book if your life depends on it they just ain't going to do it but as 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 mechanics that's not really one of our problems uh, Screwdriver. I tell you what, uh, Scott, come over here. Get, get, bring a big screwdriver. We in. Undo my my transformer. When we talk about the about the crazy things that can happen, we told the story uh, in 1973. Uh, those th those were the days when the service department for Quality Farm and Fleet was. Gene Volker and Ben Ballone, see, you know, uh, if I had a problem, I'd call Ben and tell him, and Ben would take it from there, uh, and everybody had a problem, send all their junk to Ben, see, you know, and uh, we had a guy in, at Rural King Supply in Paris, Illinois, uh, named uh, Charles Smith, who, for Rural King Supply, was the Benny of their company, and he called me, and he said, Gene, I got a problem, and I said, yeah, what's your problem? Now, this guy was a crybaby, okay? Everything was always wrong, and his back always hurt him, and he's overfed and undersexed, and, you know, general complainer. And I said, Charles, what's wrong with you? He said, I got 12 brand new 120,000 BTU heaters, and they all smoke. And I said, ah, oh, bunk. I said, what did you put in, a hydraulic fluid or something? You know, he said, Gene, you better come over and look at them. I don't know what's wrong with them. I can't find anything wrong with them, but they smoke like, like locomotives. So it's a four-hour drive from St. Louis to Paris, Illinois. I drove over, and there they were, sitting all out there. And I said, well, you know, come on, let's take a look. And I got into the little darlings, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I tightened, and I fiddled, and I checked pressures, and I couldn't find anything wrong with them. But you plug them in, they just, I mean, I'm not talking about a little smoke. I'm talking about smoke would boil out of them. And I said, well, I, 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 and I was standing like this, looking at the heater, looking down inside the heater, and I reached down and flipped the heater on, and the motor and the fan went in the right directions, and I flipped it off, and it coasted down to a stop, and it looked kind of funny. And I did it again, and the fan, you know, the flutes are supposed to look the way the fan's running, right? It's supposed to scoop up the air and push it. Well, the fan was looking that way and moving that way. The fan was made backwards. Now, of course, I hadn't been messing with these things for several years, and I said to myself, you know what it is? They've changed that fan where you can reverse it. Now, of course, you ain't going to tell Charles that, because Charles said, well, you don't know a damn thing, Volker. I should have called you. So I took my toolbox, and I took the motor off and pulled the fan out, and you can't reverse it. It's a one-sided fan, and it's got, got the connector on one side, and you can't put it on the other side. It ain't going to work on the other side. And I turned it around, I hit it with sledgehammers, you know, I did all the things a good mechanic does, and I couldn't make it work. I finally called the office, and all of those heaters had the same fan in it. My partner got on the phone and called Wayne, and Wayne said, oh, you found some of them. <laughs> and he said, yeah. <laughs> the story we got after we, we came up with uh, like 463 over the years was that one of the guys was teed off at the supervisor and he was on this machine that, that he took the fan and set it in the jig and put the side on and the machine went <coughs> you know, and, and canned it on or crimped it on. And about every third one he'd turn around and crimp it on the wrong side. You know, it's like the guy working on the, you know, and I saw this with my own eyes. I saw a guy take a handful of nuts and put them in the door well of a Chevrolet car. I saw it with my own eyes. I said, what'd you do that for? He said, the run of nuts trying to find that rattle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the guy really just, just industrial sabotage, is that what you call it? From that day on, I called Benny. Oh, I guess Ben had 85, 90 of them, right, that year. Uh, you, nothing you could do but just replace the fan, you know. But I guess we've run into at least one every year since, haven't we? Uh, we've run into one this year. Yeah. Uh, uh, in some way, 
the heater would go out, and if the guy really wasn't persnickety about odor, uh, the heater would run kind of half-heartedly, but it would run. See? And he'd say, you know, if it, finally, if he came back to you, and you just, you know, you're looking at the heater, and the first thing you'll see as you open this up, that this hole inside will be full of soot, dirt, black. And without looking at it, this whole side here will be black because, see, every time you stop it, it's pulling all that smoke right back into the, into the cavity. And you'll, you, believe me, you'll spot the backward fan. I got one hanging over my desk, right in the back of my desk. It's just an example of what can happen. What do they call that, Peter's Principle? Or what, what principle is that when, if it's, if it's going to happen, it will happen? It's some kind of principle, Kelly Principle or something. Yeah, it might be Yakimash. That's what Betty said, you know how to get a one-arm pull lock out of a tree? <laughs> Don't you like that? Yeah, it's cute. Are you Polish? No. That's a shame. Waste it. <laughs> one of the cutest pull lock jokes I've ever heard, that I thought was the cutest one in the world, was the one about the pull lock that came home from work and caught his wife in bed with a, uh, with a stranger. And he run and he got the 38 and he put it to his head and the guy started laughing. He said, don't laugh, Joker, you're next. <laughs> don't start those, right, Ben? Now, uh, we, you know, we've often talked about, in back in the old days, about the ease of, of, of working on a heater. So we devised the double shell where you could take eight bolts off and lift that off and there's the whole heater looking at you. But the Wayne Burner people really had, I guess, the easiest uh, uh, heater in the world to work on if you knew the tricks. I walked into shops, qualified mechanic shops, and saw the Wayne Burner laying in the middle of the floor and asked him, what are you doing? Changing the nozzle. Yeah. Now that happened right over here in, in Elkhart, Indiana at the Farm Fleet store. I walked in, the guy had four heaters and all of them had the burners off and I hadn't seen four burners off in my life, you know. I said, what's wrong? He said, they all need new, burn new, new nozzles. And I said, the hell they do. What, you, you, well, you gotta take that son of a bitch off to make it work. I know you don't, you know. And it, he, 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 I, thought, I thought the guy was gonna cry when I showed him how you take one nut off and take the guts of the heater out. I really thought he was gonna cry. You know, he should have cried. You know what I'm talking about? How long have you been with the company? About a month. Son of a guy. Yeah. <laughs> you do any mechanic work before that? Yeah. You see that knife? Don't lose it, because you're going to have to put it back on. That's, that's tough. Now, let me tell you something. That say things that can happen, that I have actually seen happen over the years, that you would never in your life ever expect to happen. I, know I mentioned that if the fuel leaves the tank, and by the time it gets to that nozzle, if, if it can suck air somewhere, uh, it'll create uh, smoke and fumes. And I went to Sedalia, Missouri, where a good friend of mine has a rental yard, and he had uh, four of our 120s, and he said that they fumed, and he said, Gene, I can't make them not fume. He's a pretty good mechanic. So I went over one, and one, and one evening on my way to Kansas City, and I worked on them for him, and I couldn't make them stop fuming. And I couldn't figure out why they were fuming. And finally, the last thought, I took an Allen wrench and took that little nut off right there, and I slid this part out, and the girl who put that together put it together so strong, must have been Polish, that she punched a hole in the tubing. And it sucked air and, and fumed. All I did was change that, uh, that, that one piece, and away we went. Everything was fine. And all four of the heaters has that hole punched. Isn't that amazing? These are just some of the things you look for when, you, when you're desperate and, you, and you've got no place else to go. Another thing that happened to us, and, and this happened last year, 
On the 120, you're supposed to have three rings on, on the air baffle. And the three rings means the center ring, one, two. This, this happens to have four rings on it. Now, when you, when you work it on a heater that's last year or the year before, you simply take a pair of pliers and... Well, that's not a good pair of pliers. Where's a good pair of pliers? There's a good pair of pliers. All you do is just take a, a pair of pliers and where it's pinched and just work it just, just very lightly and, you, and it pops off. Now that's, that leaves me one to go tomorrow. <laughs> All right, and then let me explain how this happens. We receive this Wayne burner in a box and it has no nozzle in it. It's got a nozzle holder, but no nozzle and the rings are all left on because if you were using this heater in New Orleans, you'd want all the rings on because the lower you get, the more oxygen you have, it, the heavier the air. By the same token, the higher you get, like you get to Denver, you break them all off because you need all the air because it's thin air, right? For the Midwest and for our general selling area, we're supposed to have three rings and of course, uh, the girl who's supposed to pop the rings didn't pop the rings. Now this came out of my inventory that I use as shows and it happened to have them. This year you won't have that problem, but if you get a heater in that's been last year vintage or the year before, you know to look for the three rings and then pop them off and that's just, it's that simple. You don't have to move anything. Now, if you don't, ha if you change it out, now you know if we said you're gonna change the filter regardless, right? Bingo, you change the filter. You always change the nozzle. When you get up to that point where you get to the nozzle, put a new nozzle in it. You can't clean it, and you can't tell if it's dirty. You just put a new one on. Those are the two parts that you always replace, automatically. Uh, when you set this in your book, you have the, the uh, you know, it's supposed to be an eighth of an inch out in front of the nozzle. It's supposed to be a half inch above the center hole of the nozzle, and it's supposed to be an eighth inch gap between the electrodes. About the only thing I could warn you on is that these insulating uh, bars must not be busted. If they bust, they'll short circuit back through the housing and you'll lose your spark. There is a, 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 a round metal shield, but I have had people, you know, 200 pounders like this guy goes, <laughs> right? Just set it good and tight, but not too tight. Yeah, the way old Gene always did it, that's me. I always made it as tight as I could get it, and then I made it one more turn. Give one more turn. Now, if you don't change this outside of that, there is never any reason why you have to worry about the space up from the nozzle uh, to the front of the, of the draw assembly because it's all governed by a sitting on the side of the heater. But well, we had one uh, young man yesterday who told us that he got a heater in that the guy had done everything to, he had changed everything. And he asked us how he could best reset his heater. And we told him, now the best way you can do it is to go get a heater off the floor and bring it back there and take that draw assembly out and make that old one just like that new one. Don't worry about a lot of major now, just, just make it the same and make all the fittings on the side the same and you'll be home free. If you get the ruler out and read the book, it can confuse you, okay? Now this, this measurement here is very, very vital, but it's very easy. It's in every, every operating manual. And the electrodes will burn down. You will we'll have to replace the electrodes from time to time because they'll burn sharp and you'll move them up, bend them in, get your spacing right, but they'll burn to a point where you'll want to replace them. Yeah, okay. When I first started talking about the 40, we talked about a 140,000 BTU heater, and we talked about um, nozzles. And uh, on high pressure heaters, it's even more critical than it is on the low pressure heaters. You have the same nozzle uh, type for the 
40 and the 55, you have a different type for the 60, 100, and 150. But on high pressure heaters, you'll have, and I just reached in the box and got two at random. One's a one gallon at 90 degrees. And the other one I got was a two gallon at 60 degrees, which is exactly double. And if you look at the nozzles, just pick them up and look at them, there's damn little difference in them. You can put too big a nozzle in a heater. Now, you won't do it because you're too intelligent. You know that if you get a heater in, it's an, an 85,000 BTU, you open the parts list, and it says use a 0.85 times 60 degree B, right? And you know that's what you've got to put back in it, correct? But the customer that brought the heater to you don't know that, and he's liable to put anything in it. Always be conscious of the fact that you've got to check the nozzle and the heater and make sure that the right size nozzle is in the right size heater. If we took that two, two gallon nozzle, which is a 280,000 BTU nozzle, right? 140,000 per gallon, it's a two gallon nozzle, and put it in that heater, it would burn about that far out. Hot. And of course, it burned the combustion chamber out of it. It also burned the paint off of it. it make the high heat limit switch kick out, and it would generally screw it up. But it will screw in the, no in the nozzle holder because they're all screws in the same. And for the, the, the newer men here, like you, Tim, you've got to be conscious of the fact that the heater is built for a certain size nozzle. You've got to put that nozzle back in it. Now, when I pull this out, being a brand new heater, it says on the nozzle, 0.85 times 60 degrees. You don't want to put a 1.1, right? We want to put a 0.85 by 90 degrees. There are 90 degree heaters made, you know, nozzles made. Now I want to show you something, and Ben can kind of take a reading on it. For our authorized service stations, we, we've uh, come up with a, a, a little, uh, well, it's a nozzle organizer is what it is. When we set up an authorized service station that's other than a, a Mid-States member, we make these up for them, and of course, we give them the box, we sell them the nozzles. But this box holds 13 different size nozzles, the rubber grommets you need, the springs you need, the nozzle holders you need. With this box, you can repair any heater that Champions made in the last 10 years, okay? It's an organizer. It's nothing more, nothing less. You have these nozzles you, in Muskegon in the parts department. I suggested to, uh, to Ben and to Everett uh, that they might take a, a look at it, and we could supply these to you in your store if they decide they wanted to do it. It's going to kind of be up to you whether or not you think it's a good idea. <coughs> So if you, and if you had a, had, uh, say, a number, find one that's empty, because I got some empty. Let's say that you run out of 114138, that's uh, what the nozzle for the 155. You simply order that, and you put it back in your organizer and put it back on the shelf. Okay? So Ben will be talking to you about, about it a little later, and if you think, if you like the idea, you probably get them. If you don't like the idea, you better tell him, or you'll get them anyway. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing fine. All right, now we just pull off the, the inside of the, of the Wayne burner. The other thing that we should talk about, about especially the air scoop heaters, is the wiring. The wiring on these heaters gets a little bit difficult, even for me. Whatever. Up until two years ago, uh, or this is the third season, we had on the side of the heater, in this uh, here, a regular electrical square electrical junction box. And all the wiring of that heater came to that box and were twisted together with wire nuts. Now, I guess I went 15 years 
begging the engineers to do a better job, a neater job, one where you and I could read it. You know, it really, you really had to be a real first class detective to run down the wire you know, on a heater because there was no color coding on the wires and you didn't know where in the hell that wire went until you traced it. You with me? So we had a, a, a situation where one of our farm girls, now you know if you take three wires and put them together, you've got to twist them in one fashion and then put the wire nut on and twist it in the same fashion. True? Well, she didn't do that. She was left-handed. She twisted them to the left and put the wire nut on the right and when, by the time they got to you, and the guy touched the heater, he got shocked, and when you opened that up, a whole bunch of wires looked at you. All the wire nuts fell off. See? I'm not talking about some, I'm talking about thousands of heaters with all the wires sticking up in them, you know. And we got problems. So that's when they finally, finally broke down and admitted that they could do something, and we came up with the new wiring center and it's beautiful. Now on, on the plate that covers it is the wiring diagram. And it really tells you where it goes. It really makes it work easy. Very, very easy. Uh, now I won't tell you that if you get in an old heater you should put this new junction box on because it would be a, a, a pretty good sized job. It could, you could do it. But it's not necessarily uh, a, a, a necessity to do it. Now the way I, ex I would recommend you do, if you have a heater that the wiring's all screwed up on, again, take a new heater and follow the new heater's diagram as of how it should be wired and if you copy the one heater, the, old, the new heater to the old heater, the old heater will work like the new heater does. Okay? This is just one mechanic to another. That's the way I do it. If I open up a heater this year and I start studying it and somebody's been messing with it, I, ha I know what the biggest heater we make is a 650,000 BTU. It's about from here to Francis, about that high and about that wide, and it's a big heater. Sold one to one of our St. Louis distributors. They come and got it and took it away, and a half hour later, the guy called me and said, can't get it to run. And I said, well, and I've known these guys for 25 years. I said, I know what's happened. I said, you've got an idiot with a screwdriver. You know, it, it's it's... It's terrible, you know. What happened? Well, it wasn't fire off, so I checked the wire and changed a few things, and I can't get it to fire. Well, what he did was he changed all my wiring. Now, I don't take a 650 apart once a year. It's just not necessary. So the only way I could reconstruct his heater is to take another 650 out of the crate and go piece by piece by piece by piece until I knew I had it right, and then it worked. You know, can't even charge him for it. I told him that I was just going to kick him in and get his attention. I was getting two by four and hit him right between the eyes. Down. Now, well, we got this apart. Let me show you the other little item that you, I know you guys love. You love them. I love them. It's called flame out control. You know what a flame out control is? That's this little gadget. See all that fancy little wiring? The, uh, the OSHA Department of the Department of Labor came up with an idea about 12 years ago that an oil heater could possibly flame out, continue to pump oil and, and saturate an area, and then flame back on and burn the house down. We've never had it happen to us. We went to Washington and argued about it. They said, you will have a flame out control, and if that heater flames out, it turns itself off. Well, then we started, and most of you older fellows remember that we went through like 11 different makeups of flame out controls. Some made by Penn, Honeywell, Bergwarner, you know, everybody said they could make one that would work. And it wasn't until we got with the present people that, that we really came up with a flame out control that really, really worked. And it's a cadmium cell, that's what this little thing is here, is a CAD cell. Cadmium is a material that under uh, light influence creates millivolts of electricity. With that electricity that you're, you're creating with light, with that light right there would do the, just as well as a flame. You run that electricity back to, a, to a, a control center 
that has a 45 to 60 second delay in it. That delay is only to allow the fuel to pass through the system and arrive where it can be burned. If that cadmium cell does not see light in 60 seconds, the electricity going to the heater springs the, the, the ETA breaker switch open and closes the heater off and the heater is dead and you have to go back and physically push a button to reset the heater and start it over again. Now, it doesn't seem like, it's, like it would be, would be too much trouble, but the problems we have, of course, is the application of the heater. This would be fine if you put it in a closed box in a, a home where it was, you know, protected and nothing could get to it. But you put it in a heater like this, and the problem you have is like dirt. You know, if this is in a, a feed mill where you have a lot of dust, and that dust gets on that CAD cell and clouds over it, it'll shut the heater off, just as if the fire went out. Now, what we talked about earlier, let me just rephrase something for you. If you have a heater come to you and that cadmium cell is disconnected, and you can disconnect it, just as easy as anything, and wire direct, you're liable if you don't replace it and put it in and make it work. Now, since we went through 11 different makeups and styles and, and, and you know, the best thing that you can do if you get in a heater that the flame out control is not working and it's, say, a year or two years uh, uh, old or older, simply take the flame control off you want me to hold it and then you? Uh, take, take the flame control off and go and get a, a, a flame out control kit and, uh, and replace the whole kit. Now the reason for that is that all the different cadmium cells that we use over the years have different ohms of